we have a quorum. The meeting is starting at 7 p.m. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Clerk Reed. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Monday, January 27, 2000. 20 Evanston City Council meeting. Uh, I believe Alderman Braithwaite uh, is on his way. I think we're expecting him tonight, uh, so we will have everybody here tonight, he's hopefully. Here. He's here. Oh, he's here. All right. So he is he is here, and she'll be coming, uh, coming on his way shortly. Um, all right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, begin this evening's meeting. Um, what I'd like to do is on the agenda, we had uh, the SOAR program, which we're excited to uh, to recognize tonight. Uh, and I'm going to ask the city manager as the sort of the chief executive officer of the city, uh, who was instrumental and in her team in putting this program together uh, to talk about this and, uh, and recognize the participants. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So tonight, the City of Evanston would like to take a moment to recognize three residents who have completed an apprentice training program managed in conjunction with Bulling and Andrews, BOA Construction, and a few subcontractors. Uh, back in September, this apprenticeship kick off, kicked off with the Skills, Opportunities, and Resources Program. It's also known as SOAR. Uh, this started at the Bulling and Andrews headquarters in Chicago in conjunction with the, uh, the work for Evan, from Evanston Workforce Development. Um, this program is um, innovative because we had obviously many challenges trying to figure out a way to um, work with the community on how to get more people involved in the Robert Crown project and I really commend Billy and Andrews for um, trying to be creative and innovative about how they approach this and I'm really excited that we're able to recognize the program participants here tonight so um, at this point I'd like to ask uh, I know I've, there was some scheduling conflict, so not everybody could be here, but Arthur Jones and Alex Castro participated, and they'll be represented by members of the Youth and Adult Department, and then Roderick Wright is here uh, as well, so we would like to recognize him. Uh, the participants in this program spent a tremendous amount of time, energy, and effort uh, learning various trades and capacities throughout the whole construction process. We had a lot of community partners that invested a lot of their own time trying to mentor and provide uh, job training and skills uh, to the participants, and so we really appreciate that effort came not only from Bully and Andrews but also from their partners uh, in our community and that was a lot of um, time energy and effort that was you know really well spent and appreciated by the program participants uh, the program when it concluded after 12 weeks of full-time uh, the participants sort of put on a program for uh, Bully and Andrews and showed them you know the results of their work over the course of the 12-week program and uh, it's pretty fascinating to see how everybody had progressed over that time and um, really a tribute to the work that our, and the time that was in, um, invested in, in the participants by both our staff and uh, Bully and Andrew's staff. So uh, the interesting, also interesting piece of this is that we have uh, other upcoming projects in the community uh, and this model has worked so successfully that um, the 1815 Ridge project reached out and asked if they could um, do something similar and Bully and Andrews was generous enough to spend some time with them last week uh, telling them how they implemented the program and what they did and sharing their knowledge and lessons learned about how they uh, approached it and so that it could be replicated on other projects uh, throughout Evanston so at this time I'd like Roderick to come forward and be recognized along with the youth and young adult staff and we'll get a picture thank you I would like, also like to ask Sharon Jones to come forward and, and say a few words about the program as well. Sharon Johnson, sorry, not Jones. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sharon Johnson. I monitor the uh, workforce development program for the city of Evanston. I'd like to add what a great group of uh, people this was to work with to increase the workforce capacity through education. In addition to the Evanston staff, we have roughly 41 
uh, people across varying companies along with eight businesses, including uh, a few local Evanston firms who were involved with uh, education enrichment uh, for these gentlemen. There was a lot of community involvement. And as the interim city manager has already stated, we are grateful to the Bully and Andrews and BOA construction team who provided uh, an opportunity for exposure uh, for these gentlemen who may not have otherwise had uh, great exposure to the industry. And at the conclusion, uh, all three participants did uh, arrive at different perspectives for a pathway forward, so we're also grateful for that as well. I was excited to uh, have a firm foundation for growth going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I have one other announcement this evening. I'd like to introduce Nick Cummings, our new deputy city attorney. Uh, he started last week, and we're very excited to have him on board. He comes to us from uh, the CTA, where he primarily worked in personal injury litigation, and he will be handling a large caseload for us going forward in our, all of our litigation. Good evening, uh, council members. Nicholas Cummings on behalf of the city of Evanston, finally. Um, Background is uh, served Cook County residents for about seven and a half years as both a, both a prosecutor and defending civil actions cases. And as the interim city manager just told you, <coughs> excuse me, serving the CTA, defending personal injury cases. Excuse me. So my entire legal career has been spent defending uh, municipalities, and I look forward to serving the city of Evanston. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, I have, um, as, as you well, many of you know, Michelle Mason Cup, our city attorney, has also uh, moved on to a new position. And so we hope to have an announcement soon about our city attorney position. But um, welcome aboard, Nick. We're really excited to have you. All right. Th thank you. Uh, I know there was a light on in the mid middle of all that. So I just wanted uh, Alderman Fleming to have a second. Yeah, I just wanted to, from, from our side here on the council, to, to thank um, Ms. Johnson and um, the gentleman from Bully and Andrews, I was able to have a conversation with them and former employee um, Kevin Brown when they first were talking about this. And I know, and I'm, I'm not on WEBE, but I know that he was very concerned with our push for him to hire locally. Um, and so just hearing him think about how he can do this and all the opportunities even past the Robert Crown construction project that he thought he can pull um, you know, people into for this. And then also just to, again, applaud our youth and young adult team because I know they went out really to find um, just the right people for this opportunity and remembering this gentleman who came up and spoke to us several weeks ago about his background and being able to get a job the next day was really encouraging. So thank you all for the work you did in here that we don't always, you know, see on our side, but it's making a huge impact in our community. So thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Alderman Fleming. Anything else, City Manager? City Manager, are you all set? That is all my announcements. Oh, thank oh, you very okay. much. Uh, Clerk Reed. Oh, uh, Alderman Rainey. Thanks. And I would like to say, as a South Evanston resident who was attempting to get to Valley Grocery Store on Sunday, no, it was Saturday, I had to fight my way west on Main Street because there was so much traffic and so much parking, and I was so excited and so thrilled because everybody was at Robert Crown, and I thought, this has actually happened, and it, it was just so amazing. There was a huge tour bus, and I don't, I don't know what was going on there, but it was happening. And I thought, and, and it isn't really all open yet, and, and you couldn't find a place to park. You could hardly drive down the street, and people are very excited about this building. And it's so beautiful, and it's not even finished yet. Yes, thank you very much. I will give an update on the opening day. So we've had some delays with getting the steel for, to construct the library and community center portion of the building. Uh, this the uh, ice rink side is uh, precast, so it's uh, I like I liken it to a pole shed. It's much easier to construct and faster. Uh, so that's why that portion of the building got done first and is currently open. Um, but it is the fanciest pole shed you've ever seen, and we're getting we get, we're getting a lot of value for our money. Uh, the other part of that, the community center part with the gym and the library is, you know, very technically uh, challenging to build a, a, a gym over the top of a library and make it be not uh, loud, bouncing basketballs and things like that. And plus we had a lot of, of delays uh, with the steel arriving at the site. So the library and remaining portion of the building is slated to be 
uh, open to the public on February 29th. Uh, so well, coming if, soon. If, if no one knew, uh, you would think the entire place was open because of the crowd. So. Yes, it was yes. And once see. the construction is complete, there will be more parking opened up to the public, so there will be less, less congestion in the area as well. I liked it. Great. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk, any announcements? Yeah, I'm going to be making this announcement uh, a few times between now and March 17th, but uh, as the office is uh, starting to get a number of phone calls about election information, uh, I guess we'll start putting it out there. Uh, so we the March 17th presidential primary is coming up. Uh, early voting starts on March 2nd, and it runs through March 16th. Uh, early voting will be uh, every day, including weekends. Uh, the times are listed on the city's website. If you go to uh, the city's website and go to the city clerk's page, uh, forward slash election information, you can find all of this. You can request a mail-in ballot online uh, through our website. That link is also available online uh, and you can uh, have your ballot mailed to wherever you are uh, in the nation or abroad and mail it back. If you need any uh, help with any of this information, you can reach out to the clerk's office uh, by calling 847-448-8189 uh, or you can go to our website and uh, all of this information is listed. Uh, as usual, we will have a 2020 uh, candidates guide listing all of the candidates that will and referenda questions that will be appearing on the Evanston ballot, but that ballot has not been uh, certified yet, so when it is, uh, we will update that page uh, with the requisite information. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Clerk Reed. Okay, we're gonna now move into public comment. Uh, we have seven people that have signed up for public comment tonight, so per the rules, each person will get three minutes uh, this evening. Um, and uh, if you haven't been up here yet this new year in 2020, we have a new system that seems to be working pretty well. Uh, so you're going to see some lights up there at the podium. Um, and, uh, and Clerk Reed times this machine up here for the allocated amount of time, which is three minutes a day. Uh, it'll turn yellow, meaning you got to wrap it up. And if it turns red, your, ti your time's up. And then I'm going to call on the next person. So uh, today, our first speaker is going to be Toby Sachs, then BJ Jones, then Diana Heyman, and then DeKel Fox. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Toby uh, give, Sachs give us one second. I'm sorry, Toby. I just want to make sure we get you all that time. Mm -hmm. oh, will it work now? Okay, you're set. Thank you. Thank you. Toby Sachs from the 7th Ward, speaking on behalf of the Evanston Arts Council. So I have Beth Adler, the chair of the Arts Council, with me and several members in the audience as well. Uh, we're speaking about the amusement tax. The Evanston Arts Council discussed the amusement tax at our December meeting and is unanimously opposed to revisions to the ordinance to remove the exemptions to the amusement tax for not-for-profit arts organizations. In short, don't tax the arts. We understand there may be interest in including stadium events and amusement tax, but ask you to be careful to avoid unintended consequences. Blanket removal of the not-for-profit exemption would tax the revenues of the jewels of our performing arts community. Organizations like North Lake Theatre, just as they move home to Evanston, Mudlark, Evanston Symphony Orchestra, Fleetwood Jordan Theatre, the Actors Gym, Evanston Dance Ensemble, Piven Music Theatre Works, and the North Shore Choral Society. They've all benefited from Arts Council grants, generally to support their school's outreach and equity initiatives. Imposing the amusement tax on these organizations would cost them more than they receive from us as grants. Those costs can only result in ticket price increases, driving down participation in the arts and equitable access to performances, just the opposite of what the Arts Council is working to do on your behalf. If the ordinance is changed, please protect these cultural treasures by continuing to exempt both of these cat categories. Itinerant performance organizations that do not have their own performance space and live cultural performances with less than 1,500 seats. At a time when Emerson is receiving international recognition for your progressive reparations initiative, let's not be seen as the city that decided to impose a, reg a regressive tax on the arts. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Toby. Thank you, Beth. 
uh, B.J. Jones, Diana Heyman, and Dekel Fonda, and then um, Marsha Bernstein. Good evening. I'm B.J. Jones. I am a 36-year resident of Evanston, a proud member of the mm -hmm. Evanston Arts Council, and for the last 22 years, the artistic director of Northlight Theater, formerly the Evanston Theater Company. I want to talk tonight about the proposal to impose tax on nonprofit artistic institutions, and I speak not just the, as the artistic director of Northlight Theater, but as a tax-paying citizen of Evanston. My wife and I were drawn to Evanston so many years ago for so many reasons, schools, the lake, the services, and the diversity. As young parents, it was the civic model of where we wanted our children to grow, learn, and thrive. And we're proud of that choice and grateful for all that Evanston has to offer. And even though the taxes are challenging, we value highly what this community aspires to be. But the notion that the cultural assets, the nonprofit cultural assets that we value and that we distinguish Evanston from other communities should become subject to taxation is simply regressive and misguided. There are no other communities in this country that impose an entertainment tax on nonprofit entities. Not Chicago, not New York, not Los Angeles, no, not even Skokie. Certainly the cost would have to be passed on to our customers, and the impact of our already modest budgets would be detrimental to our work, our growth, and our audience base. Witness the recent closing of the Children's Theater Emerald City in Chicago, who could not keep up with the costs versus ticket sales, or the downsizing of the vaunted uh, Actors Theater of Louisville by 15%. Statistically, ticket prices impact audience. In the case of Northlight, an entity that is projected to spend some $56 million over five years, not in ticket sales, but from attended expenditures like restaurants, shopping, parking, and employee expenditures while working in Evanston. The average expenditure customers make while attending nonprofit events is $24.60. Fewer attendees mean less business for the community. In Northlight's case, whose mission includes growing education departments serving so many of Evanston's nonprofits like the YWCA, Family Focus, and of course the schools, the impact on our ability to serve the community would suffer severely. Evanston needs to find its welcome mat again and open doors for the arts, for equitable housing, and for new businesses. The arts are the path to a more creative solution than regressive taxation. I hope that Evanston will put out its welcome mat for us on Church Street. Thank you. Thank, thank you, BJ. Uh, Diana? Diana Heyman, uh, DeKel Fonda, Marsha Bernstein, and then Maria Lopez. We've also got Cesar Marone here from Sketchbook as well, moral welcome, support. Welcome, Cesar. <laughs> yeah. Ready for me? My name is Diana Hammond, and I own The Wine Goddess on Main Street. I'm here today because in November I was sent a screenshot of my Eventbrite page by the city's revenue manager and informed my shop was liable for a 5% amusement tax on tickets sold for my special events. I am here to vehemently oppose a small local business like mine has to solicit Evanstonians for yet another tax, and my argument goes like this. The liquor businesses in this town, in particular, already fork over thousands of dollars each month into the city's general coffers as we're forced to collect a whopping 16.25% in sales taxes, 1.25% going to the city in home rule taxes, and 6% of which goes into the city into the form of liquor taxes. I'll remind you, no other community around here has such a liquor tax. Uh, hardly anyone in Illinois has a liquor tax and of the handful of communities that do have liquor taxes, most are at 1% or 2%, not anything near the 6% that uh, is charged for Evanston's uh, liquor sales. It's the highest in the state. Evanston also charges their liquor businesses leaps and bounds more than surrounding communities in annual liquor license renewal fees. Each year I pay $5,550 for my liquor license. If my same business was in Winnetka, Skokie, or Kenilworth, that would be $1,200 a year. And even Chicago, it would be $2,200 a year for my same business to operate there. Also a far cry from the 55 50 that I pay uh, annually, and that's right out of pocket. 
Enter the amusement tax. When I last came in front of the city council to fight the liquor tax and failed miserably, I heard through the grapevine that some in the city were calling me the wine goddess, W-H-I-N-E, saying I just have to differentiate my business and make people want to shop there despite the tax. And now I have the city's revenue manager sending me screenshots of my Eventbrite page soliciting an amusement tax on the exact same differentiating events the city suggested I offer to weather the liquor tax. What kind of money are we talking here? Uh, in November, we did a live event. I would have to owe the city $28.60. The same check that I would have to send the city for my liquor tax was $2,953. The point I'm trying to make is that liquor businesses such as mine already collect boatloads of money for the city. To add yet another tax is to nickel and dime the said same businesses time and time again, tapping the same well for the city's budget shortfalls. And at some point, it grows tiring. So my time is up. Great. Thank, thank you, Diana. I just thank, want to say that I, I do stand with Diana and the, the previous speakers. And uh, if something must be done, um, I would ask that you look into uh, looking at businesses like ours as amusement is not our primary business. Uh, we bring uh, bands or we bring uh, other people in in order to bring people to shop and buy items that already have those 6%, the 10.25% uh, taxes. Otherwise, we'd be dead in those days. Okay. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, Dekel uh, Fund, then uh, Marsha Bernstein, Maria Lopez, and then Ali Harnins last today. Good evening, everyone. Dekel Fonda, second word. I'm here to speak in support of Resolution 16R20, which is the request by uh, Marcos Rivera and Piloto Neves to open a restaurant in the West Village. So I am tonight representing the West Village Business Association and the Asbury Dodge neighbors. The former uh, Kurtz Cafe, I know, and there was more than that before that. There were many things there. Right now it's a dead zone. And the Hartwood, Cafe, the Hartwood Center is directly across the street from, from the uh, boarded up restaurant. And they bring in thousands of people from the North Shore and Chicago um, every week. And if Nancy Floyd was in town, she'd be here to speak to this. They need a restaurant. We need a restaurant. The Business Association needs the restaurant. So we met with Marcos and Piloto in the summer. They came very respectfully to the neighborhood, to the Business Association. Many of us met with them at Hartwood, and they asked if we would be interested in the type of restaurant they wanted to open, and we were absolutely uh, unanimously in support of them opening. And then we had hoped they would be open in September, and then October, and then November, and we're, now we're in January, almost February, and my understanding is they've run into some unexpected issues that they did not um, anticipate. So I'm here to ask on behalf of the Business Association and the neighborhood to please help them in whatever way you can to um, finish the work that they have started and open the restaurant, because all we have at this point is Panino's and a lot of fast food restaurants on that street. Thank you. Thanks to Kel. Uh, Marsha Bernstein, uh, then Maria Lopez, then Ali Harned. Good evening. Thank you for letting us speak. I'm Marsha Bernstein. I live in the fourth ward. Uh, I'm also on the board of Chicago Area Peace Action. And um, we felt we all happened to be here because Peace Action at the last council meeting was also supporting the anti, the prohibition of nuclear weapons issue. And while listening to the committee meeting prior, planning and development, we heard that there was a drone thing that came up, which the same groups had come to the city council, and I realize not all of you are the same people, but we came to the city council in 2013 appalled at the thought that Evanston could need or use a drone. For what? We had a meeting with then Chief Eddington, and he said, you know, I hear you. I understand where this could be 
a serious concern when it comes to surveillance. And we all know that surveillance is a big issue these days. And he's, we got a resolution passed through the city council of a two-year moratorium because he wanted to have a chance to see what other municipalities were doing vis-a-vis -vis drones. We checked after hearing about this particular drone issue, and we know of no other municipality that is looking at drones. The question is, why drones? What grant is this coming from? Is it like it was back then, the military surplus where they have like way too much extra stuff that they would like municipalities to, you know, to get for free because they don't need it? Well, we don't need it either. We do not need our citizens to be surveyed. There's already an Illinois law passed in the Senate by uh, then Senator Daniel Biss that prescribes what can be done with drones. If indeed Evanston is seeking to get a drone, we want citizen input, which is what we were promised way back when, on how and why these drones could be used, under what circumstances would it be warranted, you know, it, would they need a warrant, what would be done with whatever information was gained by the drones. Um, we're not in favor, you know, in, a, in an emergency, absolutely, but not as a general use for surveillance of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, Maria Lopez and Ali Harned. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, my name is Maria Lopez, and we're just here to introduce ourselves. We are the new owners of Tapas Barcelona, and we're just excited to be on board with the city. This is my husband, Horatio. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, it just uh, our main purpose here is to introduce ourselves. Uh, you know, we know Tapas Barcelona has been a fixture in the first ward. And uh, we want to, uh, you know, continue the, the excellent uh, cuisine and service that uh, it offers the city and its visitors. And uh, we look excited. We are very excited. Uh, we also accept the responsibility. We know the great responsibilities that it comes with uh, running a business that serves alcoholic beverages. And we are very uh, uh, attuned to the, the, the needs of the city and uh, uh, what do we know the, those responsibilities come with. So uh, again, uh, thank you. We look forward to being part of the, good, the great city of Evanston. Great, thank, thank, Everyone thank, is welcome. Thank you. We, we appreciate your investment in Evanston, and, and it's a wonderful restaurant that many people have been to that have been here for a long time. So for those in the audience, it's on the agenda tonight for a liquor license. It transfers because of ownership. Uh, Allie Harned, you're next. Wow. Three minutes tonight. This is very exciting. Um, I'm Allie Harned from the Second Ward. Uh, good evening, Honorable Everybody. Um, I want to say that I'm still having a lot of feelings about the hearing um, that happened on January 15th, and I still encourage everybody in the city of Evanston to watch it because it's very interesting. Um, we have been busy preparing for our um, petition for judicial review hearing tomorrow morning at 930 at the Daily Center. Um, and that's partially why I don't have like super prepared notes, but I just have a few points I'd like to say. Um, so we, um, we want to have an opportunity to tell all the older people about what EVI is, what the Evanston Voter Initiative is, and we will be requesting formal meetings with you, and we hope that we can um, have that opportunity to explain it to you and why it's a great thing for Evanston and not a scary thing. I'll do a quick explanation right now. This is what I've done thousands of times with thousands of Evanstons who signed the petition and thought it was a good idea. Evanston Voter Initiative is an opportunity for Evanston citizens to have a way to make local legislation. So if there's something that we want to be a law in Evanston, whether it's about amusement tax or um, the arts or affordable housing, then we can um, gather a group of people together and go to the city clerk's office. He will prepare a referendum question, he or she, future clerks, 
um, prepare a referendum question. We'll go out and gather the signatures. We need 8% of the number of people who voted in the last gubernatorial election. Currently, that's 2,799 people. It's a lot of work to get all those signatures. We worked really, really hard to get all those signatures. Then, within um, 30 days, I believe, no, 70 days after we submit this petition with all of our signatures, then it goes in front of city council. You have the opportunity to vote it up or down. If you vote yes, it becomes a law, and we got what we wanted, and you got a great thing. But if you vote no, then it automatically goes on the next ballot as a binding referendum. And if it passes by the people, then it can become a law. You still have 30 days in which to disapprove that, but you would be doing it against the will of the people. So that's just an interesting thing to consider. Um, so it is an additional way for legislation to be made in Evanston. Now, there were some things said in the hearing that I thought were interesting that I want people to um, look out for. Um, one of the things that we noticed, like we've been watching it again because we're taking notes for our hearing tomorrow. Um, in the beginning of the hearing, uh, Mayor Haggerty said that he was going to give five minutes to each party for our motion to dismiss, but 10 minutes for the main argument, which I think was alluding to the fact that it was going to, our motion was going to be overturned. Um, then later, um, Alderman Rainey made a motion to dismiss our petition to, to, uh, our petition to, um, dismiss the objection and sustain the objection, uh, sustain their objection at the same time, but we hadn't even had our arguments yet, so that was weird. Um, but then later, she made an interesting comment where she was asking about Arlington Heights, which is a community that has this type of law on the books, has for 39 years, um, and she said, why doesn't the, why hasn't Alder, or Arlington Heights ever used this method before? And she's like, maybe the city council listens to them. And I was like, ding, 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 ding. Like, yes, that is part of why uh, ballot initiatives are good. They increase voter turnout, they increase voter engagement, they increase um, the ability for the people to have a voice in, in Evanston. So I think it's going to be great, and I'm looking forward to the hearing tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Allie. All right. Thank Gila, come on up. All right. We got one more, one more here. If you just give your, give your name so we'll get it for the record, sir. Hello. Um, my name is John Prince. I've been um, in Evanston for about two and a half years. I attended um, Illinois State University and Northwestern. Um, I also do tech design. I'm responsible for the new um, Apple um, camera phone, the, uh, uh, a bunch of other tech, the fold up, LG, Lyft, a lot of stuff. But I was also in the uh, music industry. I, I write for Jay-Z, Rihanna, um, Beyonce, um, Cardi B, Drake. but. Um, recently, there's been um, some things that have been going on in Evanston that you guys probably have been harassed about or being have been aware about, but you don't know how to deal with it. For one, there was um, some tainting of the food at Trader Joe's and at Jules, and I reported it to the uh, to the office here in Evanston. I reported it to police department. I also reported it to Trader Joe's and Jules. It it was removed. Now it's happening again, and a lot of things are happening are <clears throat> based on a few people that I know for sure are, <clears throat> are involved. Um, I talked to Jan Schakowsky. I talked to her about it. She, um, we got in touch with the FBI. They talked about it with, the, um, with her and what to do about it, but it has returned. The people that I know for sure that are involved, because I was in the music industry, are um, Rahm Emanuel, Tom Tunney. Um, also, they had some other people that they are dealing with right now that you probably wouldn't think are involved, but if you want to get down to the business of what's going on, it's between the Republicans and the Democratic Party. But it's, it's extended its way through um, Chicago and other areas. These guys are influencing um, elections, politics, um, politics here in Chicago, Evanston, Skokie, and a bunch of other places around the United States because this is basically like some civil um, civil situation. N not civil war, but it's something that is going on right now that you see on television with all the chaos and stuff. This is, it's it's probably hard to believe because I lived in, Man <clears throat> excuse me, I lived in Manhattan and I um, came home like nine months before 9-11 before 9-11, so I'm not really good at public speaking, but <laughs> I, can, uh, I can write. So the thing is, I've been aware of what's been going on for a while. These guys have been involved in a lot of the elections in Chicago and here, and they're trying to compromise people 
with um, with money, being generous on one side, but then causing some kind of sick, demented um, um, poisoning with the food in those in this area and Chicago and around the United States. So okay. I would say be careful. I know I got a few minutes, Thank but be careful, be aware. I took some of the products today to um, city council. I'm going to contact um, Jan Chikowski again and the FBI Thank just you. to let you guys get ahead of on what's going on. Um, one guy that I knew from Trinidad, he was eating and <clears throat> had a heart attack. So, and here eating the food at Jules. So, thank you, thank you, John. Any delusional yep. thing that I'm making up. All right, thank, God bless. It. Have a great okay, day. Okay, you too. All right. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming out for public comment. Um, we appreciate everybody's uh, input on a variety of issues. We're now going to move into uh, the agenda this evening. Uh, the first order of business is a special order of business, um, which is SP1. It's a discussion regarding the proposed revisions to the amusement tax ordinance. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the city manager to kick us off on this one to, to start the conversation. Uh, but before I do that, could I just have someone move this item? Move approval. Second. Second. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, continuing the conversation that was started last year during the budget process, we have a short presentation uh, regarding the amusement tax and some uh, proposed options for the council to consider. There's uh, many uh, components to this that have been inquired about in the past couple of months, so I look forward to a robust discussion amongst the council tonight. And then Kate Lewis Lakin is going to lead off the presentation. Great. Welcome, Kate. Good evening, uh, Mayor Haggerty, members of the council, City Manager Sterling, Click Read, uh, Kate Lewis Lakin, Budget Coordinator. I uh, am here tonight to review some options for adjusting our amusement tax. This came up during the 2020 budget discussion last fall, uh, so we wanted to bring that forward now in the new year talk about uh, some options that you may consider. These were all presented in the memo uh, and where we can go from here. Maybe. No, keep clicking forward. Thanks. So just to review uh, our city's current amusement tax. So it's currently applying to any event, exhibition, performance, or presentation or show uh, within the city. So this is including at the moment uh, any movies, any live performances that are happening within the city. Uh, currently, it does not apply, though. There is an exception for governmental agencies, religious societies or organizations, and live performances that are conducted by a nonprofit organization. This is just a review of our current amusement tax revenues. You can see these have uh, been pretty stable around the 300,000 number, up a little bit and down in, in certain years, depending on the, the types and scope of events that we've had. We received a large amount from the source last year. That was due to some one-time payments uh, of prior year taxes. We're expecting 430,000 uh, in the 2020 budget. This does include the increase for uh, going from what 4% to 5% in this year. As stated, so the memo's got uh, a number of potential changes. We're presenting these separately for you to just so for ease of presentation and consideration, uh, we would expect, though, that there will be some combination of these. So even if we're presenting one sort of on its own, you don't have to take it on its own, know that these can be put together in the proposal that we would come back with. So first, of course, discussing removing the nonprofit exemption. Uh, this has come up specifically with some larger nonprofit events that are in town. We can, you know, we can discuss that further, whether, again, that gets paired with the second being adding a seat size minimum for the application of the tax. Seat size could be applied to for-profit profit events only, non-profit events only, uh, or there could be different thresholds for those categories. Uh, this is a, a, a form of the tax that a couple of other communities use. So Cook County, Chicago, both have seat size minimums on their taxes. Uh, so it's easy to be able to look to those communities and see what those levels are. Uh, we did include some information attached to the memo about some uh, Evanston venues that may be affected by this. Uh, we've got those up on this slide. We can come back to that if it comes up in the discussion. We also uh, 
discuss adding an exemption for certain types of events or locations. Uh, some of the items that have come up during public comment are if there's an event at a business that's not primarily doing events all the time, right? If it's a restaurant, if it's a coffee shop, if there should be an exemption for that, if there should be an exemption for a theater that doesn't have its own space to perform, but instead is performing uh, in other locations. And then also just looking at adding types of amusements. This would be uh, a pretty simple addition to the code, um, but just looking at, especially the first one, Skokie is adding a few items that we don't have because they weren't around that much when our amusement tax was created. So putting in virtual reality some of these amusements that are coming up more. Um, Chicago includes a couple more participatory amusements that we also don't currently include. So considering that going forward. Uh, just an additional consideration that we want to highlight. Uh, the reason we're sort of talking about amusement tax, wanting to bring it up again, we see the economic trend is to be moving from purchasing goods and services to purchasing entertainment, or sorry, from purchasing goods and products to purchasing entertainment and services. Um, so we want to make sure we're paying attention to that as we move into new, new years, new decades as a city, um, and, and make sure that our tax base is still able to support the services that we're providing. And I think that wraps me up. So we can do questions. Uh, Hitesh and Johan are also available to answer questions on this as well. Thank, thank you, Kate. Do you have anything else, uh, City Manager, you wanted to add before we start? No. Nope. Okay. All right, we're going to open it up now to, uh, to a conversation amongst the council. Uh, Alderman Rainey. All right. I, could we start a list of what we absolutely want to exclude from the tax and maybe things that we have no problem including in the tax. I mean, that's how I'm trying to look at this. So if you want to do that, I absolutely want to exclude from the tax um, any performing art, I'm going to define it like that, for example, mudlark, any performing art uh, in children's theater, any per anything like that, any performing art company that does not have a permanent venue to call its own, in other words, itinerant, that they should not be taxed. And they've got to be uh, a not-for-profit. Any not-for-profit performing art company that has no permanent venue should not be taxed. No museum or art museum of any kind should be taxed. Um, I want to make certain, and I don't know how to say this so that it's legal, but any, any activity that takes place at Northwestern under the guise of the approvals we just gave, the 7,000 seat events, that's got to be taxed. These folks have a hotel that ought to have a hotel tax that's not taxed. I don't want us to lose the opportunity to have an entertainment tax when, you know, Fish or Springsteen, anybody comes there. I don't care how many people are sitting in the audience. They have to be taxed. It, or, or North, I, I don't believe we can make the Northwestern pay the tax, but the people who come to that venue have to pay a tax for those events. And if we're told that that can happen, then I think we ought to repeal their ability to have those events. And I, I'd be willing to lead the charge to do that. I mean, they, that has to be taxed. Is there any reason from our legal counsel that we could not impose a tax on those events. Alden Rainey, uh, members of the council. And I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the uh, the um, sports tax that we already we have. Uh, so I'll have to look into that and get back to you. I want to give you a for sure answer when we look into it. Um, so the legal department will get back to everyone. Okay, that's on my list. Um, what about the um, 
Do we still have GameStop? We approved a, a thing called GameStop one night. It's a video place. GameStop. It's a retail no. store. Yeah. No. We don't. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay. What about what about the? Um, Oh, I've even been to it, where you go and you have to get yourself escape, room. escape yeah. the escape room. Is that text? Yeah, we have so an escape we room. Do we do we have to be on the list. That's that's entertainment. That should be on our <clears throat> list. I will add that to the include column of my sheet. Um, I heard BJ say tonight that Skokie does not tax performing arts, not for profits. I read last night. Yeah that Skokie does not exclude North Light Theater, uh, the, the North Shore Performing Arts Building. Did somebody on our staff write that? That's correct. Skokie exempts all uh, other nonprofit uh, performances, but the exclusion does not apply to events that happen at the North Shore Performing Arts Center. So wait, say that again. So uh, my memory of it is that it does not apply to uh, events that occur at the North Shore Performing Arts Center. So they don't ta tax those. That, sorry, the exclusion does not apply, so they do tax those events. That's yes. what I thought I yep, read, yep. yeah. And that would be my concern that. about uh, exempting itinerant theaters is that you, you could have this, uh, some theaters may turn into a North Shore Center for Performing Arts where in, a, in addition to their own theater company, they will have other events from other providers. And so that's where you may be looking at the seat minimum threshold versus the status of the theater when looking at options for applying the tax. Okay. All right, we got we got lots of lights up here, so let's uh, get moving around here. Uh, Alderman Wilson, you were next, and then we'll go to Alderman Ruth Simmons. Okay. Uh, Alderman Rainey touched on maybe most of the concerns I had. But, you know, one thing that's not excluded from this, for example, would be a for-profit business. And I know a number of these uh, do have uh, events where they uh, sell tickets, but they're fundraisers. So it's not sponsored um, by a non-for-profit. It's actually held by a for-profit enterprise, but it's to raise money to give to um, like whatever, food pantry or you know, a number of different things. So um, something along those lines. I think we've been, our, our, our businesses in town, particularly on places like uh, Central Street, Main Street, Dempster, uh, and now downtown with the New Fountain Square, have been doing a great job of creating experiential opportunities. So what I don't want to do is punish businesses for doing that. So, for example, if they're having collateral uses with their business, something like at the, uh, at the Wine Goddess or um, Sketchbook or, uh, you know, maybe outside in front of a, a location uh, in the downtown area, uh, I don't want to, um, again, I, 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 some people call it nickel and diming. It's almost to me like it's punishing them, but um, I want to promote that kind of uh, creativity. So I really, if it's, if it's an accessory, uh, I don't want to say accessory use, if it's a, a collateral activity uh, that's not a main part of the business. So let's make it, I don't know how you do that. Maybe you say if it's, it generates less than, you know, X percent of the sales of the enterprise or something along those lines. Um, but um, I, I don't think that we should be including that. And even the way it exists now, I'm kind of surprised that any of those things would fall into the categories. Um, you know, escape rooms. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking of that as a category. Yeah, you know, and if you if you're uh, you know starting a new business, I'm sure a lot of these businesses have no idea that they might fall into this category, and it wouldn't be fair to, you know, stick them with a you know an escape room with a bill. Oh, guess what? You know, you got a bill for the past you know four years for something you had no idea you had to pay. Um, if you were having a poultry show, uh, poultry shows are called out specifically. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that kind of I think gives us an idea of how long. Uh, the ordinance has been around without us taking a close look at it. So it, it obviously needs to be rewritten. So, um, you know, maybe we can leave the poultry shows in there, but uh, uh, but make sure that we have, you know, a rational kind of a approach on this without running off our, our most creative businesses uh, in our community. 
Thank you, Alderman Wilson. Uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons, and then Alderman Braithwaite. Thank you. And Alderman Rainey may have covered this, but I would support um, an exemption from nonprofits, um, obviously those that don't have their own location, but additionally um, with a seating capacity below what a um, – Fleetwood Jordan Theater or a Norris Culture Art Center. So what's their seating capacity? Was it? Did we have that one up on the slide? Yeah. That one, I believe, though, was covered under the governmental entity. Yeah, governmental. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. The Family Focus Theater is or the? Uh, you mean the Fleetwood the Jordan Theater? Fleetwood Theater is, is okay. that That one is covered under the governmental exemption. Okay. And then what about um, the proposed North Light? How many seats is that? 350? Oh, 350. Oh, 310. 310. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Alderman um, Braithwaite, then Alderman Fleming. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, uh, thank you, staff. Um, for anyone watching, I know every time we talk about new possible uh, opportunities for revenue, it's, it's really under the direction of, of council and the reason is because we always have to find ways, creative ways to uh, help bring cash into our budget. Um, this one is a little bit tricky though because, you know, the same time we're looking to provide additional taxes, we have our businesses complaining because of tax increases. So I think this is something that we're all very sensitive to anyone that's watching in. Um, Alderman Rainey, I'm just going to follow in your footsteps. I, I would agree. I would support, along with you and Alderman Simmons, just the exemption for our non for profits based on the criteria you just laid out. Um, and I also want to uh, be very supportive of our small business community as well. And so my concern, and I think Alderman Wilson articulated this, is you know when our business is that if entertainment is not their major source of income, I see it more as just a marketing tool. And I don't think it's worth the resources of our staff, and I'll use the word nickel and dime, yes, when they're spending money to bring in entertainment, and there's really no guarantee that it's going to increase their profits. So I'm not in favor. I was trying to find it and how it was laid out, but any small business, wherever our owner from Wine Goddess, uh, any bar, restaurant that invests the dollars to bring a one-time musical act, I don't think we should uh, charge that entertainment tax. And then I would like clarification in terms of Northwestern. I just made an assumption that whenever they sell tickets that it falls under the regular, I don't know if it's an athletic tax, but we typically tax those. So I'm not sure where we're making a distinction with that. So I know when uh, they have sporting events, the, sure. the, they are, those are taxed. I think this is different if they hold uh, special events like concerts. Uh, I think we're looking to tax those it's now. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But it's my understanding, and Alderman Rainey can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're looking to tax the performers, not necessarily Northwestern. Is that correct? Yes, my understanding of the way that these new special events at Northwestern will work is that the applicant may not be Northwestern, it may be a concert promoter, and in which case okay. it would fall under the ordinance uh, as as it's currently written. But I understand the direction that the council is, is giving and that we will make sure that uh, no matter who the applicant is, that there is, uh, that is included. I have it in the, on, on my notes here. So if, whether we do that with a seating capacity or uh, a different way, um, the direction is clear. Thank you. That would make sense. Okay, okay. thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, Alderman Fleming, then Alderman Fisk. Yeah, um, I, sorry. So I can agree with things that were said. My, I guess, public statement, because I know the nonprofits, you know, have come out and I've gotten some emails is, you know, we, we don't usually tax nonprofits. We understand, you know, you have an exemption, so you're not paying property taxes. And similar to whatever we talked about last week, which I've forgotten already, but, um, you know, we have obviously our tax bill. Some people's tax bills are going to be going up this year. We hear a lot from businesses and everyone else about the taxes in Evanston. And I also, you know, have my own frustrations about parking increases and those things. Um, this one I would support because, you know, the, the nonprofit community, granted you're not, you know, in it to make the money, you also, we have buildings that are not on the tax rolls. And so that burden is picked up then by our either commercial 
properties or our residential properties. And we're very mindful that, you know, they, they can't bear the bunt of everything that we need to pay for here in the city. So obviously Northwestern being a larger one, but we have lots of other nonprofits that do a variety of things. Um, but if you have a space, if you own a building and you're not then paying property taxes, you're not contributing in that way. So I think to have this tax on tickets that the customers are, you know, paying and kind of passing through, um, while I understand the discouragement, it's also a small way in which, you know, you're contributing then to the overall health, financial health of the city. And it's just like if you go somewhere and people say, if you're going to use your credit card, you know, we're going to charge you an extra 5% or whatever it is because that's what we're paying the credit card company. Um, and I think people in Evanston who love the arts, people who come from outside of Evanston who love the arts, while they might be frustrated, I would hope that they would understand that this is going to the financial health of our city. We really want to be able to keep the um, – income diversity that we have in our city and really the only way for us to do that is to think of different ways and this is again not going to be the the largest way but think of different ways in which we can bring in additional dollars to support the city's overall growth um, and just the you know maintenance of the city versus having everything rely on the property tax owners who feel like not only they're paying these increased property taxes but they're paying so many other things that contribute um, while you know, other folks are not necessarily paying the same thing. So that is why, even with nonprofits, I could support this type of tax. And and hopefully, again, it's, it's a small tax, you know, relatively small tax. So hopefully the people who can afford to go to the theater and pay $35 are not going to be turned away by, you know, this 4 or 5% tax um, because they understand the benefit of it towards the city. They also understand that you still, as a nonprofit, are getting whatever the price you're paying for for the ticket. You're just kind of passing through the tax part to the city. Okay, thank, thank you, Alderman. Uh, Alderman Fisk and then Alderman Wynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and Alderman Fleming, thank you for uh, those comments. They were along the line of, of what I've been trying to struggle with. Um, it's not clear to me that if you add a tax to a ticket that that's going to discourage attendance. But maybe that's true, and maybe that's something that we could find out a little bit more about, because I think that's a legitimate argument to say, okay, if we add a tax, that's going to mean a certain percentage of, of, uh, of our attendance will go down. And we need to know that piece. Um, I don't remember in the discussion about Northlight, is that property coming off the tax rolls? It's currently on the tax rolls? Is it coming off the tax rolls now? Um, My understanding is that it will it will be owned by Northlight and it'll be off the tax rolls because it's a private nonprofit. Okay, yes. I'd, I'd like someone to remind me how much taxes we're going to be losing from that <clears throat> property. It doesn't have to be tonight; it can be uh, another another time. I I don't attend something church. We can gather that information and provide it. Um, so those those are the two pieces that I'm kind of struggling with. The, the other part is that Northwestern legally is not for profit. Is that, that's, I mean, and I don't see how we can sort of juggle non for profits. I think um, numbers of seats is a better way of doing it. They won't be selling the tickets. Yeah, the distinction they, is that. Uh, yeah, I know, I, and I understand that they would have a promoter or someone doing that, but there are instances that may, they may be selling the tickets, and if they are, do we want those to be excluded or not? If we go by numbers of seats, then they wouldn't be excluded. Um, so I, I think we need to take a look at that. Uh, so those were my, my questions right now. Um, Thank, thank you. Uh, Alderman Fisk, um, excuse me, Alderman Wynn, and then Alderman Ravel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I generally agree with um, most of what's been said. I do think itinerant theaters should be exempt. I agree with museums and the collateral use issue, uh, I think, is uh, absolutely really critically important because that is what we are seeing in a lot of our small business districts are the creative aspects of our businesses that just realize that they can attract people and keep them in their businesses if they provide entertainment as well. So uh, I, I think those, I agree with all of those. Um, but I, I don't agree with uh, Alderman Fleming and Alderman Fisk's issue. I mean, what we're hearing from um, some of the not-for-profits and from Northlight is that they have what's called a halo effect, which is, you know, when people come to uh, the theater, they're going to go out to dinner. 
And, you know, those are people who we don't, who are not doing that right now to that address, all these various addresses. So I do think that that's a critical, important, critically important things. And we don't really know what people's price sensitivity is to these uh, not-for-profit entertainment events. Some people are really price sensitive and uh, and will choose someplace else to, to be to to go and our parking frankly adds that extra little irritant so uh, I don't think that we should um, add this to the not-for-profit thank you thank, thank you Alderman Alderman Ravel um, I'm gonna second just about everything that Alderman Wynn just said um, and uh, uh, one other contribution that I think the arts community um, makes that we haven't mentioned tonight is um, they do, like a th the theaters do a lot of um, inviting in school children and um, others for free performances and, um, you know, encourage uh, participation in the arts through some of these um, free activities. And I think so I think that's something that um, is another contribution that they make, an indirect contribution that they make to our, the financial well-being of the city. Th thank you, Alderman. All right. Um, seeing no more lights, uh, interim city manager, do you think you've, we've had enough of discussion? You have a, a good enough sense of uh, direction moving forward and, and bringing something back for the council to react to? Yes, I, I do think we have enough direction from the conversation, so thank you. I appreciate that. I think that it will take us some time to work through this with our law department, so um, as far as when this would return to council, it, I don't expect it would be until at least March or somewhere around that time frame. Okay. All right, great. Th thank you, everybody, for that good conversation and for the folks that came to public comment to talk about this issue as well. We're now going to move on to the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, I'd like to approach it the same way we have recently, which is to give everybody a few minutes and identify any items that you'd like to request be removed from the consent agenda this evening. You remove ED. ED1, please. I'm sorry, say that again. ED1. ED1? The Economic Development one, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. A7, A12, and ED1. And I'm sorry, what was the last one? Oh, ED1. Oh, it's which is already off. Got it. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes. So you don't want any of the agenda to be read except the items that are being taken off? That's correct. That's how we've been doing it. Well, we did it once, I think. No, we've done it multiple times, Alderman. So how how does this address transparency? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I mean, we've got the agenda up on the city's website. It's been up for several days before the meeting, as it has been. Um, you know, people that are in attendance certainly at the meeting tonight all have a co all have a copy of it. They can receive that when they come in. Um, so I, I think those are. I think that was the rationale that there is transparency out there, uh, and that from a efficiency standpoint, in terms of running these meetings, reading every item. Um, was no longer necessary. Well, at the committee, we had some very interesting discussions about a couple of the items. So I guess, I don't know, it just seems to me to make little of our work. Some of us spend hours and hours on this. I mean, again, I just want everybody to be clear. I, I as the presider, am certainly not standing in the way of oh, anybody in, wanting to take charge. something I, off the I get agenda. In charge, yeah. hmm. I also need to remove a fourteen for uh, just a clarification um, on an agenda error. 
Okay. Um, can an alderman just uh, remove that? You're Those removing exceptions, it. I move. You're, can you remove Alderman Wilson? Can you just remove A14 just so it's an alderman removing it? Okay, I uh, ask that we remove A14. Okay. All right. Any other items? Okay. Seeing none, um, would someone like to move the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? second. Okay. Um, so there were no items on the consent agenda that were to uh, suspend the rules for introduction and action. Is that correct? I want to confirm that that's correct. I didn't see any. A10 and A13 were um, moved for intro and action in committee. So A, A10 uh, and A13 were moved for introduction and action. Uh, I'm sorry. You want to remove A11 now? You want to move it for introduction and action? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So I move that uh, we uh, excuse, suspend the rule. Excuse me, um, Mr. Mayor. I think I'm the chairman of this committee, and shouldn't that be my job? I'm happy. I'm happy to have you move that if you'd like well, to. Yes. It, it would be good yeah. if you called on me. Okay. And said, oh. um, okay. Here oh. are the items you would like me to deal with. Alderman Alderman Rady, as as the You're driving th this. Thank ship, you. So. Okay. Alderman Reddy, as the chair of the administration of public works, would you like to uh, move the suspension uh, of the rules for introduction and action? Thank you, Madam, uh, Mr. Mayor. Excuse me. Um, so A10 is Ordinance 10-020. Do you just want me to read the title or what? Um, ordinance 10-020, decreasing the number of Class C liquor licenses for Pete Miller's Evanston LLC Rock and ravioli and creperie San Germain um, this was for introduction and action and because of that I move to suspend the rules Second. Second. Okay. my understanding is we do them all as a group though right so so that was second. And can you do the next one that you want to suspend the rules for? Yes. Um, the next one would be Ordinance A12, Ordinance 12. What? A12 is off the agenda, so we'll talk about that later. Oh, so that one you want to take off. All right. So then, um, uh, let's see. Which is the next one you want me to read? A11. 11. Ordinance 11020, increasing the number of Class D liquor licenses for Barcelona North, Inc., doing business as Tapas Barcelona, 1615 Chicago Avenue. This is for introduction and action, and therefore I move suspension in the rule, of the rules. Second. Okay. Okay. All right. Is there any other one that we want to suspend the rules for? Hearing none. So I just want to make sure. So there were only only two. I thought I heard. Which one? So so far we're suspending the rules for introduction and action for A10. Okay, which is Pete Miller's and Rock and Ravioli and a Creperie Saint Germain, which are all removing their licenses for um, A11, which is Tapas Barcelona. Okay, for them to get the license this evening. And then I also did a change at the committee level for someone help me out it's the uh, movie theater is it 13 a13 13 is the movie theater yeah 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 that one thank you all right so alderman rainey can you yes. introduce that a13 one? ordinance 13020 amending uh, city code section 346 by amending class b liquor license this is for introduction and action uh, and therefore i move to suspend the rules second Okay. Um, all right. And then uh, any others on the liquor ones, or that was it out of committee? Okay. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Alderman. Uh, City Clerk, could you take the uh, the roll on suspending the rules? I'm sorry, there was an action. Oh, a roll on suspending the rules. Yeah, we that that was what would just happen. We suspended the rules. There wasn't I'll, a vote. To yeah, suspend. you're taking the vote right now. Okay. Oh, so that doesn't require roll call. So all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so rules for those items have been suspended for introduction and action tonight. Uh, City Clerk, could you take the roll on the consent agenda? 
Yes. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Suffredin? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. And Alderman Wynn? And Alderman Wynn? Okay, great. The consent agenda passes the Evanston City Council on a 9-0 to zero vote this evening. Uh, we're now going to move to the items that were taken off the agenda. Alderman Rainey, if you could take us to uh, and in move uh, A7. Thank you. A7 is uh, Resolution 5R20. Our staff recommends adoption of Resolution 5R20, authorizing the manager to execute a real estate contract for the purchase of a vacant lot located at 1829 <coughs> Simpson Street for an amount not to exceed $55,000. Source of funds for this proposed acquisition is Capital Improvement Funds Parks Contingency. I move approval. Second. Okay. Open for discussion. Uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, support this. It is an opportunity, of course, to expand our parkland, um, but uh, to develop this particular lot would be challenging. After having a discussion with staff, it would be very unlikely um, to be residential because of the curb cuts needed. Um, we saw the challenges and, uh, from, and the feedback from the community in a business going there. Um, it would be a nice opportunity just aesthetically to have more green space, but as well um, invite the community to think about what they might like to see there, perhaps a terminating vista, perhaps a field house, perhaps a bathroom. Uh, many suggestions have been shared from the community, and I'm hoping that we could support this at, at below market rate, and we have the funds in our park contingency. It had also been supported some time ago um, by Alderman Holmes that we acquire this lot. Thank you, Alderman. All right. Seeing, seeing no more discussion, uh, this has been moved and seconded. City Clerk, could you please take the roll on A7, Resolution 5-R20, authorizing the city manager to execute a real estate contract for the purchase of vacant lot located at 1829 Simpson Street? Yes. Alderman Wilson. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. Alderman Sufferton? No. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? No. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. All right. Uh, resolution 5-R-20 passes the Evanston City Council on a 7-2 to two vote. Uh, we're now going to move to the next item, uh, which was A-12. Could you introduce that, Alderman Rainey? A-12. Um, ordinance 12020. Um, this is A12. The Liquor Commissioner recommends City Council adoption of this ordinance amending Class R1 liquor license from 0 to 1 for Levy Premium Food Service Limited Partnership doing business um, as Levy at Welsh Ryan Arena, 2705 Ashland Avenue, Evanston, Illinois. This is for introduction. I move approval. Okay, so this has been moved and seconded. This is open for conversation. Okay, S seeing no lights on this matter, City Clerk, could you please take the roll on A12? Yes. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? No. Alderman Ravel? No. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? No. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. And Alderman Wynn? All right, A12, the ordinance 12-0-20, uh, amending the Class R1 liquor license from 0 to 1 uh, for Levy Premium Food Service Limited Partnership at 2705 Ashland Avenue, which is Welsh Ryan Arena, uh, passes the Evanston City Council for introduction this evening on a 5-4 to four vote. Okay, uh, Alderman Rainey, could you take us to A14? Yes. Um, this is um, a typo correction, um, so just bear with me. Um, the Liquor License Commissioner recommends City Council adoption of Ordinance 14020, which amends the, it's written Class K, it should be written Class E license for package stores. The amendment permits on-site consumption for purposes of tasting only in stores. I'm not sure we have to do a real amendment. We did that in committee. It was really just a typo. Everything in the ordinance is the same. Just an E became a K accidentally. Okay. So I move, a, I move introduction. Second. 
Okay. Uh, City Clerk, do you take the roll on A14? Yes. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. And Alderman Wynn? All right. Uh, A14 Ordinance 14-0-20 amending the city code section 3-4-6 by amending the city class city's class E liquor license to permit on t site tastings uh, passes for introduction 9 to 0. Uh, that takes care of the items moved off of the administration public works agenda. We had one more item that was removed, uh, which was ED1. Um, Alderman Rainey, you're also the chair of this committee. Right. Could, could, you, I, uh, could I just explain one other item? A15, oh. a long discussion took place. Okay. Um, that has to do with your ability to um, make uh, decisions regarding the hours, the early hours, um, regarding individual events that occur, um, and the change from $500 to $100 per event for those hours. Um, it was the opinion of the committee that, yes, you could do those hour changes, and we would prefer that the, the um, fee would be $100 per event, not per night or per morning, whatever the determination was, um, because as... Um, uh, Attorney DuBose uh, stated the the events are so few and far between that it's just not worth yep. you know charging people. Okay. Um, anyway, okay. So um, economic development. Let's see. Resolution 16 R20 authorizing the city manager to negotiate a TIF forgivable loan agreement with uh, Sepactel. LLC for the interior renovation of a commercial property at 1813 Dempster Street. Um, the amount totals $24,200 toward the cost of renovating 1813 uh, Dempster Street. I move approval. Okay, items open for the conversation. I'd like to speak to it. Um, uh, Alderman Rainey, and then we got Alderman yeah. Wilson, then Alderman. Um, the issue here, um, we heard in great detail the other evening, is the owners of Libertad, the, the well-known restaurant in Skokie, just like anybody who's ever done their bathroom or anything else in their house, once they started removing certain things in the restaurant, especially the floor, which is really the, the big problem here, they found that a, a coffee machine had been leaking for probably more than a year and had rotted out the floor so that the heavy kitchen equipment they were going to put there was going to collapse the floor. And that, that was going to add a significant cost to their renovation work. And so the, the whole project is going to be in excess of $90,000, and this is going to be extremely helpful to them going forward. And it's tax increment financing. It's not capital improvement money. And uh, they're going to be able to get started and open the restaurant ASAP with this assistance. I move approval, as I already did. All right. So it's been twice moved and twice seconded. All right. We'll uh, keep going here. Alderman Wilson. Uh, and again, Alderman Rainey has covered most of the points, which I appreciate. Uh, <coughs> while I generally don't favor TIFs, this is an existing TIF, and the money has uh, been collected. And this is the purpose of it. And so this is an underutilized property. This will help ensure that an underutilized property uh, is uh, put back into, into a, a more appropriate use and an asset to the community and the neighborhood. And uh, having heard the presentations of the, um, uh, the applicants, I'm confident that they're going to do an excellent job with their business. Thank you, Alderman. Um, Alderman Fleming, then Alderman Braithwaite. Thank you. Um, and I, I did support their, <coughs> excuse me, business proposal on Howard Street, um, understanding that, you know, we do have funds to help people. Um, I understand the TIF. I understand how this works. I have a hard time supporting this one, again, just given that we did support the same business owners with city funding and also, you know, with their interest to buy the building on Howard Street. Um, I, I do want them to come to Evanston. I don't have anything. I don't, I don't know them, have nothing against them, love Dempster. Um, however, I just... Financially have, you know, if we have businesses open up, I'm happy to help them. If they're opening two 
and they need help for two, I, you know, I get a little bit concerned just in terms of the finances. Um, particularly, again, we, you know, I, I would love for us to think about how to use tips, and I've talked to Paul Samuzek about this. Um, you know how we can help more of our small business owners who run business out of run businesses out of their homes who don't have access to capital who don't have money for a storefront. So I would love to see us start looking in that direction as well. Thank you, Alderman Braithley. I'll be brief in supporting everything that uh, we heard from those uh, before, and I think Alderman Fleming. I want to thank you for raising your concerns because it gives me an opportunity just to share a little bit more for those. Uh, watching in and didn't have an opportunity to uh, listen to economic de development. So, Alderman uh, Wilson, you're, you're correct. This is exactly how we want to use the TIF as a tool. And I think what I appreciate the most is that, that we always like to look for the skin in the game. And so they're bringing 75% to the table. The TIF funding offers 25%, uh, which is traditionally what we have funded over the years for those that looking in. In addition, we want to do business with someone who has a track record. So you're right, they do have skin in the game. They, you have a pre-existing business in Skokie, you have another one in Howard, and now this will be your third business in the city of Evanston. Um, DeKell, who represents our neighbors and our, our business community is correct. We had a meeting over the summer, so even before they came and requested funding, the summer they met, they met with neighbors in the community, they listened to the input and what's what's important. One of the things that I also appreciate is the fact that as a Spanish speaking business, it will help to cater to the community that we have along the Dodge Corridor. So it's one more business for them to uh, support for that particular community. It was brought up by one of our committee members that they're going to hire locally, which is another thing that we also take a lot of pride in and we'll check that box as well. Um, and then finally, I think I covered all. I just want to thank uh, Paulina Martinez, who is part of our community economic development staff, and now I think she's in our city manager's office, who has been really hands-on with this business and walking them through the process. So thank you, Paulina, as well as uh, Paul, Paul Zalmazak and Johanna Knighton. So I am definitely uh, would like to thank those that will support this and vote. And I'm looking forward to uh, coming to your uh, grand opening once you get open. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Rainey. Well, I, I, I think it really should be said that they made every effort yes. to have their landlord yes. um, I thought you involved that. in doing some work in the, in the space, and the landlord absolutely refused. So having said that, if, if this group um, did not take the space, yeah. it's conceivable it would have sat for a long time <clears throat> in great disrepair sure. and perhaps someone a lot less responsible right. might have taken it over and it would have it would have been a lot less uh, desirable user and so i think we should be grateful and you know you can't use TIF for home-based businesses. Just, just wanted to make that right, clear. Right, right, right. Um, there are other ways by using TIF for this kind of business and for these, for for this way, we have other money left over to use TIF for to you to help home-based business. So, we we help home-based businesses with with economic development money, and we can help uh, business like this with tax improvement financing. So everybody can yeah, get help. You're correct, and I think so, it goes without saying, Alden Rainey, that you're you're right. So, and part of the the reason that we've had turnover in that in that particular location with two other restaurants is that the kitchen was inappropriate. I mean, it it, it wasn't a real kitchen, so it was like a sandwich shop with a, a grill. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, uh, Alderman Simmons. I just wanted to, for anyone that is watching and having questions about how you can get support as a home-based business, we have um, an entrepreneurship support grant. You can work directly with Paulina Martinez, and it's available um, location independent anywhere in Evanston. Just wanted to put that out there so you don't think there is nothing available to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Very business-friendly here. 
Seeing no more, seeing no more lights, uh, City Clerk, could you please take the roll on Resolution 16-R-20, authorizing the City Manager to negotiate a TIF forgivable loan agreement with Zabakli LLC for the interior renovation of a commercial property at 1813 Dempster Street. Yes. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Suffren? No. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? No. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. And Alderman Wynn? All right. Uh, resolution 16-R-20 passes the Evanston City Council on a 7-2 to two vote. All right. We're now going to move to call of the wards. Uh, Alderman, Win, uh, Alderman Wilson. No. Uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons. No report. Alderman Suffernan. Um Yeah, I was hoping I could get clarification from the chair or legal counsel um, why uh, discussion of city manager recruitment is an executive session and rather than open session. Yeah. So this is our first evening tonight uh, where we're going to meet with the executive recruitment firm that the city of Evanston hired. Uh, and I wanted the body that ultimately is going to select the next city manager uh, to have a conversation about this personnel matter in executive session. And uh, including in that will be uh, all of the um, methods that the council wants to use for public input into this and get into this process, which again, there will be significant public input into this process. If so, this is your sole decision to put this into executive session. Yes, I think this is a personnel right. matter hiring right. the city manager and I uh, know we need to get this going. So yeah, yes. We absolutely need to get it going, but I don't understand why it can't be uh, done in open session. Hey, Mr. Okay. Mr. Mayor, um, I would chime in uh, to say that I, did see an email over the weekend. I didn't look into the issue, but um, hearing what Alderman suffered and said, I have concerns about that. Okay, uh, being an executive session, and I think we should have legal look into that because it's not a personnel matter. There isn't a person. There is a personnel matter. Um, it, is our, it, is our, like it is our. It is our. It is our. It is our city or, manager. I mean, I'm certainly. Uh, you know, I, there's I, no one to protect at this moment. Alderman Fisk. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, and I'm sorry, Mr. City Clerk. This this is not appropriate for the City Clerk to take part in this conversation right now. Um, the City Clerk has served the, as the open no, meeting. No, it doesn't. Office. It, you um. are, unless I'm mistaken, you are not permitted to take part in the conversation. This is for counsel, not well, for not. For this clerk. is about an open meetings act violation, not, not potentially. For clerk, not for clerk. Let's let's. Um, uh, you know, I certainly don't want to, uh, you know, jeopardize the city and put us in a bad situation. I do know that we have um, with us this evening Heidi Voorhees, who's going to be uh, speaking with us in executive session, and perhaps uh, someone who has done this all around the country can, and certainly a lot in Illinois, can let us know um, if uh, this is something that um, has been legally challenged before that the decision-making body. Uh, Alderman Wayne, yeah. uh, I, I think that that's, I, I think our legal counsel should provide us with the answer to this or not. Uh, I don't think as much as I appreciate Ms. Mm -hmm. Voorhees, I don't think that we should rely on someone other than our own legal counsel mm -hmm. to answer that question, whether this is appropriate for the, um, for executive session. Okay. Alderman Wilson. First of all, um, you know, to me, we've brought this person here and had her wait for hours. <laughs> like, you know, this isn't the time. So, I mean, it seems to me that this would have, you know, been more timely before. I would have loved to, but uh, we didn't know. It just said personnel until Erica sent out an email so you last night. We didn't know what personnel was. There okay. was no, there was no packet. Okay. Uh, right. So my, my only question, I mean, I don't. I don't want to delay the search another two weeks by putting this on our next agenda, but I don't know why this is an executive session, again, rather than open session. It's, as you said today, the CEO of the entire city. Uh, it's a fair discussion to have in front of everyone. And to the clerk's point, we're not protecting anybody's confidentiality. There is no person. This isn't, we're not even down to finalists. We haven't started the search. So I don't know why this isn't a public meeting, why this is being done in executive session, when we've all said that this will be an open and public process. Okay, so I suggest and move that we hold the particular item 
until the next meeting so that our legal counsel can advise us as to the uh, propriety of, uh, and I don't even know what the discussion was going to be, so it's sort of like we're, you know, assuming that it's... Well, none, know, of, none so, of us know what the discussion right. was going to be. I understand. So uh, if that can just be uh, proffered to the Corporation Council, I move that we hold the particular item to the next meeting. With my apologies to Ms. Voorhees for... Before What's we that? vote on this, just as a point of information, was there a cost involved with you coming to travel? She's because if we're having a discussion, and I guess I'm just sharing my thoughts before you speak, no, and for the benefit of the public, we don't vote on anything in executive session. It's a it's a it's an internal discussion with council, and anything that is discussed, the vote always takes place in in public. So I just think, as a point of information, I don't want anything want to think that somehow we're cooking up something that will eventually not come to the public. And for all of us who have participated, whether it's Chief Cook, um, Director Hemingway, I'm trying to think of any other director hire, it is, a, it is an open conversation where people have an opportunity to participate on all different levels, and of course for our, our chief officer, I don't think it would be any different. So please, uh, well, you can I'll, answer the question. Executive session is a may, that. it's not a shall. We're making the choice to have this discussion in that room without the public present. If you all want to make that decision, we're going to vote to go into executive session, and you can vote yes. If you would prefer to have it, I think the best thing to do is have it out in the open with the community here. I, I, you can I mean, do it however you want. It's, we, it's your vote, your I think prerogative. Have, I think we have discussions both in public, both in the executive session, on the phone, behind closed doors, conversations take all place. I just want to clear up like any thought or air as if we're doing something uh, behind closed doors other than having a conversation that will eventually come before the public. That's all. It's right. just a, for me, it's a point of point of clarification that I choose to express. I understand. Mr. Mayor, so before you proceed, order. we've already uh, moved, this item has already been uh, moved to be held and seconded. So unless there's going to be a withdrawal of that hold, uh, I would like for us to cease discussion. Uh, but perhaps if there is a uh, move to withdraw the, the hold, then we could get um, some answers from our legal counsel on whether or not uh, this is an appropriate subject for executive session. Okay, so the second's been withdrawn. I, I, Right. So I, I'm interested in the conversation. So there's no second. So I guess we can continue Mayor, with the conversation. But can I ask this one is no, not right now, Dre. Not right now. So in just in in looking at the language of the um, of the statute, it does mention um, uh, where's the language now uh, of specific employees. So in the context of when we are doing interviews and we have um, you know. Uh, those are with specific potential employees. So we have actually individuals identified. I think at this point there are no individuals identified that are going to be uh, discussed or proffered. Is that correct, Ms. Voorhees? Like we're not talking about anybody, any potential candidates? Sometimes that comes up. Okay. You know, in discussions with elected officials, and I've done this a number of times, uh, sometimes the conversation veers into performance discussions about previous city managers. Uh, it veers into discussions of potential candidates. It's really hard for me to predict in which direction the conversation might go. Mm -hmm. um, there is no extra cost for me to come back. I'm, I'm local. I will be out of state in two weeks. So that's, that's the only complicating factor. I could try and join you by phone or figure out another way to do that. But that's the, that would be the only complication. Um, and it would not cost you anything to have me here, but I wouldn't be in the state. Okay, and, and I appreciate that. And again, I, my apologies for um, okay. you sitting here. Um, I, I think I'd feel more comfortable if we got some specific direction from the legal <laughs> counsel in writing um, as far as exactly what could get discussed in executive. And you know, perhaps what we do is we just have it on an agenda as a special order to kind of go through uh, what the intention of the plans are. That could be done at an open meeting if that's all we're going to get into. But again, uh, I think if we're going to have it as a, as a special order, we had to have to have or ought to have specific parameters on the limitations of how far we can go with that conversation and not getting into conversations about individuals. So I'll maintain my motion to hold. I don't know if there's going to be another second. Second. So we were getting legal. 
It's been well, yeah, but it's been held. It's been it's been second, and unless it's been held. I, I don't know. How does that work? I mean, when something, I mean, he moves something. I got a whole bunch of lights on. It either um, do a point of personal no, no, privilege no. or. It's been, or well, you know what we can do. We're in the middle. Right now, we're in the middle of call awards, <laughs> so we're going to get to you. We're going to get to you, and you can certainly share it at call awards. Where do? You... What about all the lights? That's what I was asking. And the lights were on before the discussion. The lights were on before the discussion. But it, and then Alderman Suffered and seconded it. Oh. Actually, I'll no, I'm, I, I, I'm having to have the discussion. I just I, what I don't. When the agenda was released, it said personnel. That was the only piece on the executive session agenda. Until Erica sent an email out last night noting in item seven that we were gonna discuss GovHR, we had no idea what personnel meant. Personnel is used as a placeholder a lot of times on executive session agendas. If I had known when the agenda went out that we were gonna have an executive session discussion about the city manager search for we had in public discussion, I would have brought up the issue immediately. It didn't come out, until, and I even asked the question of you, uh, you, were out, you were out of the office, you're in a bad spot, I apologize that I'm putting you in a tough spot. Uh, but executive session is a may, it's not a must, particularly when there's no confidentiality and we're not even talking about a person. We're talking about a position, which is the CEO of an entire city. It's appropriate to have the public be here for that discussion, especially when we were trying to say that we we're gonna be transparent about it. The cornerstone, our first discussion, should happen in public. We can later on have executive session when we get down to narrow down in candidates or if we're talking about civic people or how we're gonna do public meetings, all that stuff. But to start with a meeting in there rather than in here is inappropriate. Okay, uh, I'm gonna point out that my motion to hold was not probably proper because I had not yet moved to convene into executive session, so there's nothing to hold at that point. So if I guess if anybody wanted to speak, uh, uh, I'll, I'll withdraw the motion because it was not proper uh, in regard okay. to the fact that I hadn't moved to go into session. All right, so we'll go to Alderman Fisk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, I, I just want to clarify something because I think sometimes when we have discussions like this and Alderman Suffered and I hear what you're saying and I, I agree with you, I mean, that it should have been uh, fleshed out on the agenda what the purpose of personnel was. And um, I can't open those I, because I don't know how to open the executive session on my computer and staff will help me work that out. But um, but I do think that the way we discuss it can set up the wrong impression with the public. We're not trying to hide anything from the public. This is the way that we've done things in the past. And whether that's, I mean, we did them correctly as far as I'm concerned. Those of us who were on the council uh, when Wally was hired, um, I remember those discussions very, very well, and especially the initial discussions, and they would not have been appropriate for a public session. So I, I, see, I see what you're saying, um, but I also know that probably the discussion we're gonna have is gonna be similar to the one that occurred the last time we hired a city manager, and that should be definitely in closed session. So that's, that's my feeling about it, um, and um, that's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Did you have anything? I got your light on, but okay. All right. Um, oh, well, you go ahead. No, go ahead, Clark Reed. What do you got? It, it, Are it, we just, not in call of awards? I am in the middle of call. I am in the middle of call of awards. Okay. Okay, but I, I, I guess I do. I guess here's the thing, though. I do want to make sure that we've got some clar clarity here because I, I think there's differences of opinion about whether this first meeting with GovHR uh, is going to be an executive session or it's going to be it's going to be here public. What we have is we have the city attorney staff looking into certainly the rules and communicating back to this council. You know, in two in two weeks. Um, but again, they come back to the council and say, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, what do you want to do? Uh, again, based on that, it's just delaying it more. But people up here are okay with that. Well, and, and I won't be moving to include the personnel item on, on the, my motion. So perhaps we just excuse Ms. Voorhees in it for now and, and regroup later so you're not sitting through call of the words too. So. Yeah. Okay, so it's going to be taken off. Okay. Well, if I may still... Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to let Claire moved. read. What, what would you like oh, to add? It's moot. Well, I, I don't think so. Uh, two things, uh, a suggestion. Are we? I'm going to let the clerk give a suggestion. 
Two suggestions are looking at the law, it's very clear that it says a specific employee. So I think the best course of action, while we have Ms. Voorhees here, would be to make a special order of business for some future meeting. And maybe we can, this initial discussion will have to be in public unless we have specific employees according to the law. So I think we shouldn't delay for two weeks. We just know what we have to do. Alderman Suffered is correct in raising his issues, and we should just move forward and not, not delay for several weeks. Okay. Well, but we can't do it tonight because it's not on the agenda. No, you can place it as a special order of business for another night. And since she's here, maybe she can say yes on Monday, three weeks from now, I'll be available, or maybe she will not be. But we can know that it will be on the agenda tonight. Well, I think we should hear from the legal counsel and know what we can do, and then well, we can work with Ms. Voorhees offline and come up with the time she's available. Well, yeah. I mean, right, winging it, I don't want to wing it. So. Thank, thank you, Clerk. Uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons. I, this, I, I want to understand, just so that I understand, if we're having a discussion now about executive session and open meetings acts, why wouldn't the clerk, why, why would we need to give him the privilege to talk? Why wouldn't he be allowed in that conversation? Just understanding the process of the meetings and why the clerk wouldn't be a part of that discussion. I mean, he just was. I'm good. I, yeah. I understand that, but it was like you allowed it and you said like, I'll allow it. And there was some debate about if he should be able to talk. I'm just trying to understand why he would not have been. And I get that I, there was some concern that he should not be able to speak. It was inappropriate. I want to understand where in our rules, what's the policy that says he should not be able to speak? I don't think it's a policy that speaks to it. I think it's typically the role of the city attorney who we ha currently have a vacancy for to uh, advise the council on such matters. And in the absence of uh, that being available to us this evening, uh, the clerk has uh, tried to help so I don't think anybody was trying to say procedurally that's his role but uh, typically that would be the role filled by the city attorney if, if I may note for the council we still have not uh, complied with the Open Meetings Act and naming an, an Open Meetings Act designee the clerk used to be the Open Meetings Act designee and we currently do not have a designee okay duly noted Alderman Fleming are we done call of the wards or are we just call talking about this? Yeah, uh, if, we're, we're, if you're back to call of the wards, then we're Alderman Suffern. Do you have anything else? Okay, Alderman Ravel. Alderman Rainey. Um, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock at the Levy Center, I'm having a very packed uh, ward meeting. Um, also, I did receive information tonight from community development that the property um, North Light Theater is taking it, currently in 2018 paid $83,830.33 in property taxes uh, to the taxing bodies listed on their tax bill. Um, that's it. Oh, thank you, Alderman. Alderman Fleming. Um, a couple things. I want to thank the general assistant staff, um, particularly the manager, um, Interior Perkins. There was a client that I sent to them that was um, had some very challenging circumstances, and they were able to um, really rally and give her and her family some support as well as connections for the homeless. So I want to thank them for that because it was dire and they did it in a short amount of time with money that they don't usually have access to. Um, the other thing just in terms of the um, Open Meetings Act, I, I I do appreciate that the clerk was able to, to chime in there and, and while we don't have a city attorney and when we do get one they're going to have to take some time to get on board. I imagine I, I do think it might be good for us to have an Open Meetings Act um, person because we all have seen where you know citizens right or wrong have sent letters to the attorney general and such questioning the way we run the meeting um, the last thing is um, sorry miss Voorhees that you had to come for this I, I would I would suggest that when we have things that we're putting on whatever agenda that we make sure and I know we haven't had a full legal team but our legal team or whoever is making sure that it's going in the appropriate place so we don't have issues like tonight that we think are open you know executive session or not, and we take up the, the citizens' time with that. Um, and then my last thing is I definitely would support us having this initial conversation and in public. I understand, um, Autumn and Fisk, what you're saying in terms of things that were brought up when Mr. 
Bob Kowitz was being hired and, and things that will come up in the conversation as we're giving input to the search firm for a number of things that would be personnel or confidential. But if we're just laying out particularly, you know, five community meetings, one online meeting, whatever it is we're laying out those parameters, I do think that that's worthwhile to have in public discussion because it has been such, um, I would say, for lack of a better term, kind of tense time here in the city and a lot of citizens frustrated and a lot of frustration with many of the processes we take part in. I think we just do ourselves a disservice if we, as Ottoman suffered and said, start out in executive session. I think those things that Ottoman Fisk was mentioning will come out in other conversations, but just to set the parameter and our expectations to you and get your feedback as a professional, I think very much should be done in the public um, so that people can understand from the beginning that we do want to have their input and how we came to decision that we did in terms of giving you guidance for how to run this search for our city. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Wynn? I mean, excuse me, Alderman Fisk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, regarding um, Alderman Ruth Simmons' questions about uh, the city clerk, so in the city code are the duties of the clerk, and nowhere in the city code does it say that the clerk is going to either act as um, sergeant of arms or participate in discussion or um, have a, a role in um, discussions regarding decisions made by the city council. Now, if that's something that we want to change, we should change it. So I'm going to make a reference to the Rules Committee to see if we want to change the duties of the clerk. Um, because right now, and I have nothing against this clerk at all, I'm, I just think if we're going to have rules, we need to follow the rules. And sometimes we wander into areas that confuse uh, the path forward and make everyone uncomfortable. So that every time, and I understand, Mr. Mayor, that you can make decisions on the fly and decide who to recognize and who can speak and if someone can come up to the microphone and speak as part of our deliberations. But right now, it's not allowed. And if we want to do that, then we should allow it. So that's my reference uh, to the Rules Committee. Can, with that reference, can the Law Department work with the Clerk's Office to? That's not part of my reference. Well, that I'm asking. It's, it's, that's a request. If uh, not, then that's is, fine. Talk to you me know, talk it's to me really after. totally inappropriate for you to, to insert yourself in every comment that, that people make. That's not your job. And if it is going to be your job, then that's something that we should discuss as a council and change those rules. But this is not a conversation with you right now. Uh, I, I, okay. do, I do apologize, but just, yeah. you Thank know. you for answering my question, the Alderman. Yes, thank you. Alderman Brathwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to the second ward residents next, uh, excuse me, the second Thursday in February thir 13th, we will uh, have our second ward meeting. Look forward to uh, hosting you all. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Wayne. Thank you to all the third ward residents who came out last Thursday night for our ward meeting. And no report other than that. All right. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Alderman uh, Wilson, could you take us into executive session? Thank you. Pursuant to five Illinois compiled, sta uh, compiled statutes, ILCS 120-2A, I move that the City Council convene into executive session to discuss agenda items regarding litigation. The agenda item is a permitted subject to be considered in executive session and is an enumerated exception of, under the Open Meetings Act. The exception is 5 ILCS 120-2AC11. Is there a second? Second. second. Right, City Clerk, could you call the roll on executive se is recessing into executive session? I'll do my job. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Suffren? No. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. All right. Uh, the council's recess into executive session on an 8 to 1 vote. Thank you, everybody, for coming out.